Ladies and gentlemen, due to technical difficulties beyond our control at the moment, the Dragnet program originally scheduled at this period has been postponed temporarily. It will be heard in just a few moments. All right, here's Ed J. Boss, boss, boss is Captain, Captain Steve. Steve. My name, my name right. is Friday. We were on the way out from the office. office. It was 1038 a.m. when we got to Paris Avenue. Number 213. Yes? How do you do, Miss Wagner? Police officers. I'm Sergeant Jacobs. This is my partner, Sergeant Friday. Oh, yes, Sergeant. I've been expecting you. Would you come in, please? Thank you very much. Thank you. Hope you'll excuse the way the house looks, officers. Right in the middle of packing, getting ready to move. I understand. I'll try not to keep you, Miss Wagner. So much to do, making arrangements for Dorothy's funeral, the undertaker. Then all this moving business on top of it. I couldn't bear to stay here any longer, though. Yes, ma'am, we understand. We'll make it as brief as we can. I'd like to have you tell us about this trouble that your sister had as much as you know about it, I mean. Plain out and out murder, in my opinion. Might just as well have taken a gun and killed her, no difference. You knew all about the relationship between your sister Dorothy and this man Reynolds, is that correct? Yes, right from the beginning. I was there when they met. But do you mind if I went ahead packing these few things here? My sister's things. I'd like to finish up before I leave. Have an appointment at noon in the mortuary. Surely, go right ahead. A few books, knickknacks, personal things of Dorothy. Foolish woman, I gave her credit for more sense. Now, about this man Reynolds, Miss Wagner. I saw through him right from the start. I tried to tell Dorothy. He was a fortune hunter, money hungry. Of course, she wouldn't listen. She always knew better. Charles R. Reynolds, is that the name you knew him by, ma'am? Yes, that's right. Dorothy and I met him one Sunday night in the hotel dining room. Two of us always had dinner at the hotel Sunday nights every Sunday. That's the hotel out in Wiltshire you told us about? That's correct. It'll be exactly a month this coming Sunday. He came up to our table and introduced himself. Claimed he knew my father when he was alive. Dad owned some big packing plants in the east. Died nine years ago. Left the estate to Dorothy and me. I see. Would you have anything to add to the description that you gave us on Reynolds, Miss Wagner? I mean, can you think of anything unusual about him at all? Scars, peculiar mannerisms, anything like that? No, nothing special. Dressed well, as I say. Apparently cultured, well-traveled. Mm-hmm. He was handsome enough. Attractive. I knew it was only after our money, though. Playing up to Dorothy that way. Kissing her hand. Taking her out all the time. Probably would have tried the same thing with me. It's lucky I knew better. How did you after the first meeting with him, Miss Wagner? Did he start dating your sister Dorothy right away? Yes, the next night. Called here at our home and asked Dorothy to the theater. I think he was going to ask me, but he was too smart for that. I knew him for what he was. Hmm. Imagine that. Poem Miss Dorothy wrote in high school. Love poems. Silly. She never did get it out of her head. You and your sister lived alone here in the house, did you, ma'am? Yes, Dorothy and I and the maid. I don't want to stay here after what's happened, though. I'm going to my cousin's in Vermont. Never want to see this place again. Yes, ma'am, I can understand. How soon after you met Reynolds did he marry your sister? A little over two weeks. He'd been seeing her almost every night, taking her out dancing to the theaters, big dinners, bringing her home late. They'd sit here in the living room. I could hear them from my bedroom upstairs laughing, him telling her how beautiful she was. 42-year-old woman, imagine that. You're about the same age your sister was? Just about. A little older. People always took us for twins, though. Here's a snapshot of me taken in my 20s. The boy with me there, he wanted to marry me. My money, of course, that's all he wanted. Too bad. Dorothy never seemed to realize that about men. Girls from wealthy families, they have to be careful. We understand Reynolds took your sister out of town to be married, is that right? Yes. Las Vegas. Reynolds had told her his bank funds were tied up temporarily in a Canadian bank. He wrote Dorothy a check for $10,000, and she gave him her check for the same amount. He said he wanted to book reservations for a round-the-world trip for both of them. I see. The same day Dorothy gave him the check, he cashed it. The bank called her about it, and she said it was perfectly all right. An hour after he cashed it, Reynolds disappeared. No trace of him. Of course, his check's worthless. We found that out. Mm Mm-hmm. And you figure that's the only reason your sister took her own life? There's no other reason. It wasn't the money so much. Dorothy has her share of the estate. It's a shame, I suppose. Awful shame. Disappointment. She should have known better a woman her age. Had your sister ever been married before, Miss Wagner? Yes. When she was 18. Ran off to Chicago and married a young fellow. She claimed she loved him, too. Naturally, he was after our money. My father and I went and brought her home. We had the marriage annulled. It was that way all her life. Half a dozen men. They brought Dorothy nothing but misery. And this was the last, this Charles Reynolds. 
How about his background, ma'am, his business connections? Did he ever mention any of that to you or your sister? Claimed he had interests all over. South America, Australia. Seemed to have plenty of money. Guess his kind always has. Do you think you'll find him? We're going to try, Miss Wagner. Dorothy went upstairs to her bedroom and stayed there. She looked so strange. She took out some pressed flowers from a book. Some boy had given them to her once years ago. Don't know who. She just sat on the edge of her bed and stared at them. Old pressed flowers. Next morning, the maid came upstairs and Dorothy was lying on the floor. Empty bottle of pills next to her. Awful disgrace. Never happened before in our family. Mm-hmm. If you don't mind, Miss Wagner, we'd like to get as many particulars about this man Reynolds as you can remember. There. That's the last. I don't know what else to tell you, officer. All I know is I was young when Dorothy was young. I could have had a man if I wanted. But I didn't run off when I was 18 to marry a boy. I knew my duty. It wasn't proper. It wasn't love. I didn't run off as a middle-aged woman to marry a fortune hunter either. What made her do it? I wouldn't know, ma'am. She was your sister. What kind of a man was he? What kind of a mind? Making love, kissing her, just to take her money. Imagine selling somebody with a kiss. Well, it's not the first time, ma'am. Is that so? Look it up. You'll find it in the Bible. Eleven eighteen a.m. We continued to interview the victim's sister for another 40 minutes, and then we left the Wagner home, drove back to the office, and continued our investigation of the suspect, Charles R. Reynolds. As far as we were concerned, the criminal was new to us, but the crime wasn't. The marriage racket's as old as any con game on earth, and as con games go, it's one of the lowest. It trades on one of the most natural and normal instincts a man or a woman has, a desire for companionship, a home, and a family. And for the sake of an easy dollar, it betrays the victim and the instinct ruthlessly, regardless of the consequences. In the case of 42-year-old heiress Dorothy Wagner, the disappointment was too much to cope with. For her, the marriage game ended in the front parlor of a mortuary on South Hoover Street. For the suspect, Charles Reynolds, it had continued to be a paying business until he was stopped. After homicide detail completed their investigation of the case, and it was definitely determined that Dorothy Wagner took her own life... The matter was turned over to us. 11.50 a.m. We got off a request to Las Vegas asking them for all the information on the marriage. And then I contacted the staff's office and asked them to make a run on the suspect for us based on his detailed description and also on his method of operation. I went back down the hall and met Ed Jacobs at the R&I counter. How you doing? Not too much luck, Joe. Forger didn't come up with anything either. Nothing on him in their files. It's not much of a start, is it? Apparently, this is the first time he's worked the town. Horns, we couldn't find anything on the name, not in the main file anyway. Mm-hmm. What do you got there? I asked John to check the correspondence file. He came up with this. Uh-huh. Out of Chicago, huh? Yeah, he came in over three months ago. Inquiry from their bunco detail. Suspect name right here, Frank L. Richland. Uh, same angle, Mary Dragon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the M.O.'s pretty close. Any description? Oh, well, here. What do you think? Six foot, 170 pounds, gray, wavy hair, blue eyes, fair complexion. Uh-huh. Uh, that's fairly close, could be. Mm-hmm. Here's the alias list Richland uses, long as your arm. Here's one caught our eye, Reynolds. Alias George A. Reynolds, Thomas R. Reynolds, alias C.H. Reynolds, alias Charles R. Reynolds. Mm. Wants on him for forgery, bunco, grand theft, a lot of experience. How about a mugshot on this one? Mm. None attached, no L.A. contacts either. Then we'd better get off a wire to Chicago PD, have them send us what they can on him. Yeah. Want to prove it one way or the other by the end of the week, maybe, huh? Yeah. Copy his name down here. Uh-huh. Frank L. Richland. Correspondence number C143732. Chicago case number D-612-32. Attention, Lieutenant Smichels. I'm just thinking, Ed. Huh? The last time anyone saw Reynolds, when was it, 10, 12 days ago? Ten days ago, yeah. September 23rd, same day he cashed the check and took a run out. Well, if he's working the city for the first time, he must figure he's had some fair luck. 10000 on the first try, that's pretty encouraging. Yeah. If he gets the idea the town's a gold mine, he's not going to pull out stakes here. Hmm, figures. Probably trying to reach a couple other women with the same angle. Could be he's working on it now. Well, that's the problem. What do you mean? The women. Say he's been romancing three or four of them around town. He's got them all primed. Huh? How are you going to warn a woman about a thief before her purse is gone? 
After getting off a wire to Chicago regarding the suspect, which was in addition to the broadcast and the APB we'd gotten out on him, Ed Jacobs and I continued checking out the various contacts that he'd made in the city. We checked stores where he shopped, banks where he allegedly did business, restaurants and hotels which he reportedly patronized. It took three days of dull, steady legwork. You can say it much faster than you can do it. All of the bank references, without exception, were falsified. Where he made purchases, it was strictly cash dealing. The same for the restaurants he'd frequented. Besides meager descriptions of the man, the restaurant employees weren't able to help us much. At one of the two hotels, where we learned he was a guest for a full month, we finally netted half a lead. One of the bellboys told us that the man known as Charles Reynolds seemed to be pretty friendly with the head waiter in the hotel dining room, a Henry Kingsbury. We located Kingsbury in the dining room in mid-afternoon, directing arrangements for a large private party to be held that night. Across the dance floor, the orchestra was on the bandstand rehearsing. The musicians in their shirt sleeves. Kingsbury was reserved, not too cooperative. Yes, I was acquainted with Mr. Reynolds, no more than the other guests, though. That's not the way we get it, Mr. Kingsbury. Well, here you were pretty friendly with him. Tell me, as far as my job goes, that's my business, making people feel at home, making them comfortable. Well, I understand Reynolds was a pretty heavy tipper, is that right? He always took good care of me and the boys. The waiters were very generous. Did he expect anything special in return for the tips that he gave you? I don't think I understand. Oh, I think you do. How about it? Well, he was always very good to us, all of us. I could hardly refuse. Refuse what? When he first moved into the hotel, he became friendly with me, introduced himself, gave me a good tip in advance to take care of me. Mm. First few nights here, he spent at the cocktail bar, you know, meeting people, buying a few drinks, getting acquainted. Third or fourth night, uh, that's when he asked me. Yeah, huh? He said when some prominent women came into the dining room, wealthy women, would I point them out to him? Single women, of course. Mm -hmm. I couldn't see any harm in it. He put a $20 bill in my hand. I said, yes, I would. After all, we have to look out for ourselves. Did he expect anything else for those tips? I don't know. I don't think it would be right if I told you. You know why we're here, Mr. Kingsbury. We leveled with you. We expect you to do the same with us. Well, there was the two Wagner sisters. They came here every Sunday night for dinner. Regular routine for them. Yeah. Mr. Reynolds is at the bar. He asked who they were, and I told him. He seemed impressed. He asked me to help with an introduction to them, and I did. Next afternoon, he came to me again. He said he was taking one of the Wagner sisters to dinner that night. It was important to him. He gave me another big tip. Said he wanted us to roll out the red carpet for him that night. Mm -hmm. What'd that consist of? Well, special consideration, the best treatment in the house, you know. I was to act as if I'd known him for years. Well, it was a good tip. I did what he asked. As I say, we have to look out for ourselves. This happened more than once today? Two or three times, yeah. Miss Wagner, uh, Dorothy Wagner, she seemed impressed. At the time, I didn't think anything was wrong with it. You actually didn't know Reynolds, is that right? You'd never seen him before. Well, I suppose, yes. I only found out later, though, reading the papers. I mean, what really happened. I didn't know what he was at the time. You couldn't see what Reynolds was up to? You didn't know what he was doing? Oh, no, naturally not. He was a good tipper. That's all I know. It was the money. We have to look out for ourselves. Yeah. I felt sorry about Miss Wagner. I went to the funeral. They couldn't say I'm to blame, could they? What happened? I mean, it's not on my conscience. You wouldn't say so, would you? She's dead, mister. You figure it. Thursday, October 13th. The investigation continued. Still no sign of the suspect. We got an answer from Las Vegas and also from the Chicago PD's bunco detail on our inquiries. They enclosed mug shots and fingerprint classification of the suspect, Frank Richland, alias Charles R. Reynolds. The pictures were shown to witnesses and acquaintances who'd known the suspect, and they definitely established Frank Richland and Charles Reynolds as one and the same person. We got out a supplementary APB containing the latest information on the suspect. Saturday, October 15th, we got our second complaint on the marriage bunco artist, this time from the proprietress of a small chain of lunch counters in the San Pedro area, a Miss Hagar Lindstrom. Ed and I drove down to the harbor area where we interviewed her at one of her lunch counters. She identified Richland's mugshot. Her story of the marriage swindle matched closely with that of the previous victim, Dorothy Wagner. Yeah, he was a fine gentleman, Mr. Jan Richland. He don't know what happened. He don't know what to say. He told you he was from England, Miss Lindstrom, is that right? Yeah, he talked like English, but he could speak good English, like from London or someplace. Says he builds boats, big ones. How big you find me? Big boats. Oh, yes. He told me that's his business. He said he had lots of money. We would sail around the world on a honeymoon. Maybe he will come back still. I hope so. I wouldn't call on that, Miss Lindstrom. Would you tell us this, please? How'd you happen to meet this man, Richland? At the hotel up the street. The big hotel. I can show it to you. 
The one on Jackson Street. Yes, ma'am. They seem to know he was a rich man. Nice clothes he wore. He spent money a lot. When we got married, they spent lots of money. Where were you married, ma'am? We went down to Mexico. One weekend we went down there and we got married. It was romantic. Very nice. Even Lars liked it. Who's that, ma'am? Lars. That's him down the counter there. Lars, my brother. Oh, well, your brother went along with you when you got married, is that right? Well, Lars and I go every place together. I don't do anything without Lars. Mr. Richland was nice about it. He doesn't seem to mind Lars. Just a minute, they call him. Uh, Lars? Huh? Lars? Uh, Lars and I run the business together. At the soda fountains we have. It's a long time they have worked at it. Hard work. Yes, ma'am, I guess so. We make good living. Not easy, though. That's why it was so bad. Mr. Richland, three thousand dollars he took. Yeah, These are the police, Lars. They want to know about Mr. Richland. How do you do? How are you, sir? Yeah, he was no good. When they find him, they hit him. Now, the three thousand dollars he got from you, ma'am, how did that work? I mean, did you give him the money, lend it to him? Just what was it? When we came back from Mexico from being married, Mr. Richland and me and Lars, he said they were waiting for money from his bank in New York. Mr. Richland said that. He wrote me a check for three thousand dollars. I gave him our check for three thousand. Even Lars thought it was all right. Didn't you, Lars? Yeah, he was crazy. His check was no good. He beat him up, he punched him good. That's quite a bit of money, Miss Lindstrom. What kind of a story did he give you? He would buy the tickets for a honeymoon trip. That's what he said. A long trip together. Romantic. Mr. Richland and me and Lars. He didn't mind Lars coming along either. Did he, Lars? No, he didn't mind. Now, this Richland disappeared right after he cashed your check. Is that yes, right? sir. He got the money and he was gone. Six days ago. We never hurt him. I don't know why he did this to us. I thought he loved me. I thought he was my husband. Mm-hmm. We haven't seen or heard anything of him since he disappeared? Not me nor Lars. But maybe we know. That's why we call you officers. Yes, ma'am. We have this friend, Antony M. Svensson. He met Mr. Richland once when he was here. Mm-hmm. Svensson called Lars on the telephone. He said he saw Mr. Richland downtown, going into the hotel. Are you sure it was Richland? Yeah, he said he thought so. How long ago did he see him? Uh, last night. We got on the phone right away and talked to the friend of the Lindstroms, James Swenson. He gave us the name and location of the downtown hotel where he thought he'd seen the suspect, Richland, the night before. Ed called the hotel and checked with the desk clerk. Yeah, that's right. Fairly tall, wavy gray hair, fair complexion. Might be registered as John Richland. Hmm? That's right. Okay, we'll check with you later. Bye. Any luck? Guy registered as Harold Richland. Descriptions match. He's still there. Checked out this morning. You are listening to Dragnet. Authentic stories of your police force in action. Compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. One. Fatima's length filters the smoke 85 millimeters for your protection. Two, Fatima's length cools the smoke for your protection. Three, Fatima's length gives you those extra puffs, 21% longer than standard cigarette size. And in Fatima, you get an extra mild and soothing smoke, plus the added protection of Fatima quality. To show our confidence in Fatima, we make this money-back guarantee to every king-size cigarette smoker. Buy a pack of Fatima's. Enjoy Fatima quality, extra mildness, and superbly blended tobaccos. If you're not convinced Fatima is better than the king-size cigarette you're now smoking, just return the pack in the unsmoked Fatimas before August 1st, 1952, and we'll give you your money back plus postage. Fatima, Box 37, New York 1. Remember, each king-size Fatima gives you an extra mild and soothing smoke plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Switch to Fatima today. Best of all, king-size cigarettes. Saturday, October 15th, 2.30 p.m., Ed Jacobs and I drove back downtown to the hotel where the bunco suspect, Richland, supposedly had been staying. The desk clerk definitely identified his mugshot and told us that the man registered as Harold Richland had checked out a few minutes before 9 a.m. that morning. No forwarding address. 
We examined the room he'd been staying in, talked to the residents and the employees of the hotel, but we failed to come up with a single lead as to the suspect's whereabouts. During the week that followed, we received three different kickbacks on the all points we'd gotten out on Richland. We checked each one of them out, but they failed to materialize into anything. We stayed on it. October 19th, Wednesday, 7.50 a.m. Morning. Hi. What's doing? Charlie Frost called from Forgery and went over to talk to him and came up with something on the Richland thing. Yeah, what's that? Picked up a woman last night, name of Helen Stokes. She's got a good-sized record, checks, bunco rackets. Yeah. Got her this time on a check beef. She wrote one for $3,500. Yeah, well, how's it tie in with us? Check was made out to Harold Richland. 8.15 a.m. We signed out, drove over to the main jail, and had the forgery suspect, Helen Stokes, brought to one of the interrogation rooms. She was a dark-haired, fairly attractive woman in her early 30s. As a bunco artist, she apparently knew her trade pretty well. She was relaxed and talkative. She told us Richland had introduced himself to her at a Palm Springs resort the week before. When did the business of the check come up? As soon as we got back in town, he gave me the story. His money was in a New York bank. I played along with a gag. He wrote me a piece of wallpaper for $3,500. I did the same for him. What's the difference? Nobody hurt. Both checks, solid rubber. Maybe you forget, ma'am. There's a law against it. It's only a gag. I told you that. I would have loved to have seen his face when he found out the check was a phony. You don't think they're going to push the charge against me, do you? No, we've already told you, miss. You wrote a bad one. There's a law against it. I was only stringing him along. I knew his check was a phony, too. I didn't have anything to gain. Look, suppose I help you find him. Will you give me a hand on this? See, I get a break? We can't make any promises. You cooperate, help us find Richland, be taken into consideration. All right, you're on. You can tell lover boy I tipped you. You know where Richland is now? I can come close to it. How do you mean? I know where he'll be next week. On further questioning, Helen Stokes told us that on one occasion while she was at Palm Springs with Richland, she prowled his hotel room, went through his personal effects, and read his correspondence. She told us that she read one letter from a friend of Richland's inviting him for a visit the week of October 31st. She also noted Richland's answer accepting the invitation. She said the friend's name was Maurice Archer and that the letter came from an Ocean Boulevard address in the beach town of Venice. We went back to the office, ran Archer's name through R&I, and found out that he had a previous criminal record of petty theft and grand theft. We located him at an Ocean Boulevard address and brought him in for interrogation. If there was any trouble, he wanted no part of it. After talking to him only a few minutes, he broke down and told us where we could find Richland, an address out near the end of Melrose Avenue. It was an apartment court. The suspect was registered in one of the rear cottages under the name of Reynolds. He wasn't at home. Ed and I went on stakeout inside the cottage. We waited. 6.30 p.m. Somebody coming in? Yeah. Hold it right there, Mr. Police Officers. What's this? Hands out in the open. Come on up. I don't understand this. Want to shake him down in? Yeah. Oh, he's clean. Look, I don't know what you want, officers, but this is a mistake. Your name Charles Reynolds? Reynolds? No, my name's Richland. That'll do. Let's go. No, just a minute, please. What am I accused of? Who's accusing you? Last pigeon you had lined up. She wanted us to tell you. Helen Stokes. Stokes. Phony dame. You can't believe her, officer. She's phony. She's nothing but a con artist. That's a good reason to believe her. What? Takes one to know one. 7.05 p.m. After checking through the cottage, Ed and I drove Richland downtown and took him to the interrogation room. He'd admit nothing. We called Miss Wagner, the sister of his first victim, and she was still in town. She agreed to come down to the office to confront the suspect. So did the second victim, Hagar Lindstrom, and her brother, Lars. Cars were sent out to pick them up. At a special show-up, Richland was picked out as the guilty man. We took him back to the interrogation room. Miss Wagner was the first one called in. She again identified Richland, alias Reynolds, as the man who had married and swindled her sister, Dorothy. All right, Miss Wagner, that'll be all. Thanks very much for coming in. Yes, all right. Thank you. Look, I don't know that woman. I'm not trying to be stubborn, but I'm afraid you're wrong. I'm not the man you want. Lindstrom's are outside, Joe, waiting. All right, bring him in. Miss Lindstrom, Mr. Lindstrom, come in, please. Miss Lindstrom? Mr. Lindstrom? Yeah, that's him. Yeah. I don't know you. I've never seen you before. You married me, John. You wanted to be my husband. You said that. Why did you want to hurt me? Sorry, I don't know her. You said for you and me and Lars to go on the boat, honeymoon around the world. You and me and Lars, you said all those things. Why did you want to hurt us? No, why? Is that enough for you? I don't know what they're talking about. He bait you up. Take it easy, Mr. Lester. Lars. Lies. He said we all go around the world, honeymoon. All right, all right. Get him out of here, huh? Okay, Mr. Lester. Thanks. It's no good, Lars. 
Come. Yeah, please. Out this way, please. Yeah, fine, Jim. You hit Jim. Thank you very much. There you go. All right. All right, Richardson, you ready to give us a statement? All right, I'll tell you. You can't blame me for that one. You wouldn't have gone through with that deal yourself. Nobody would have. What's wrong? A nice-looking girl. Sure, I don't mean that. What do you mean? A big clown, her brother Lars. Yeah? How'd you like to take that along on a honeymoon? The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On January 14th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 88, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, the reason Fatima can make the money-back guarantee you heard earlier can be summed up in two words. Fatima quality. Just prove Fatima quality yourself. Just compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. Fatima's length filters the smoke 85 millimeters cools the smoke, all for your protection. You get those extra puffs because Fatima is 21% longer than standard cigarette size. And Fatima gives you an extra mild and soothing smoke, plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Prove it today. Buy Fatima. Frank Richland was tried and convicted of two counts of grand theft and three counts of forgery of a fictitious name. After serving his term in the state penitentiary at San Quentin, California, he is to be released to Chicago authorities for prosecution. Grand theft is punishable by imprisonment for not less than one, nor more than ten years. Forgery of a fictitious name is punishable by imprisonment from two to fourteen years. <laughs> have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Heard tonight were Barney Phillips and Virginia Gregg. Script by Jim Moser. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. February 18th, hear the Gala City Service Silver Radio Jubilee on NBC.